So welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. Today I'm joined by Joan Mulverhill. Joan, you're very welcome to the podcast. Let's begin by asking you to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your journey, your background and what you focused on. So over to you, Joan. Thanks, Simon. Delighted to be doing this today. Uh, to introduce myself, I suppose I should say, just me and Flanners. I am a Flanner. I am born in, in County Longford. I'm a farmer's daughter and a teacher's daughter as well, I should say, my mom and dad. Um, and I have never had the same job twice or worked consecutively in the same sector. And I've prided myself on that for a very long time. So I actually started my career in retail in Kingfisher in the UK, um, where my first job was actually buying toys. And then I worked in supply chain, logistics, projects, IT. And then I was doing that in London and Amsterdam. And this is going somewhere. So then I came back to Ireland, worked in manufacturing, negotiating car leasing contracts. And then I went from there to uh, BDO, where I was working in family businesses, succession planning and helping them, you know, not fall out over the money. And I remember being in the interview and they said to me, you know, this is a very different area for you. And I said, are you mad? I said, I'm a farmer's daughter. Farmers, we invented fighting over the money. I said, have you not seen the field? So actually, I recognized that that was a change project. And while I looked back at my career and said, I've never done the same job twice, the transversal skills of helping people deal with change and deal with new has been a, con a consistent in my life. And I am generally attracted to roles where I am working with good people doing good things. So when I finished up in BDO, I, uh, I was famously unemployed for a year because uh, it was the height of the recession. And, uh, and then I got the job as the CEO of the Irish Internet Association, which was hilarious because, of course, I'd never been a CEO before, nor had I ever really worked in tech before. So obviously I was fully ill qualified to do that, but it was transformative. I was there for seven years and had a great time. And, you know, and then I, I had a choice at that point in my career to stay in this tech route or stay in this kind of CEO vein. And I realized I love, I, I don't lead because I want to be in charge. I lead for the dirt of somebody else doing it, or you may be going the wrong direction. So it's not that I necessarily want to be that person. I, I actually just want to do interesting things. And so I decided I was going to stay in the tech side of things rather than the, the CEO side of things. So, uh, and that brought me to uh, DCU uh, as a center director for the Center of Cloud Computing and Commerce. And then that brought me to Siemens. So, yeah, I, I really, I remember talking to the guys about my role in Siemens and I said, just really interesting, lovely people doing really interesting things. That's where I want to be. And I don't really care what my job title or description is within that. It's that capacity to do really interesting things. And that plays to, you mentioned at the start of this, you're, you know, you talk to creatives and business people as well. And, uh, and it plays to my creative side. So in parallel to my career job, I have my other career as a professional artist. And, um, and those two are now really running concurrently, but, but actually not so much in parallel anymore. They're converging, which I find fascinating. As I look at the future of technology I, and, and its impact on society, how we live our lives, I actually recognize the need for creativity and creatives in leadership more and more because our organizations are going to become increasingly human once everything that has been roboticized, programmed and automated has been roboticized, programmed, programmed and automated. We're going to need more humans doing the human things. So, uh, so and, that, and what is intrinsically human? but creativity, intention and purpose and that kind of sense making. So yeah, my, my worlds are actually converging right now rather than running in parallel. And I find that very exciting time to be doing my job. Yeah, that's, that's my intro. I'm a flaneuse. I, I am, you know, wandering around with any apparent sense of direction in covert search of the aesthetic and the adventure. And that is what I get to do all the time. You know, Joan, I love that. I, I love the variety in it. I love the, you know, from the, the, the farm uh, through the the technology, I love the art. I, I you know, uh, I love the CEO stuff, and uh, it's. Uh, I suppose today they'd call it a portfolio career. 
Um, it's sort of a little bit eclectic, but fascinating. I like Let's... to think I call it collage because I'm going to go for the. I'm going to. Love I'm going to. I'm going to go for the artist version of it, which is collage. But I'm glad you mentioned the farm part because actually, I was asked recently, what advice would you give somebody? What should they read or do? And I, I suggested and recommended that most people go and stand in a farm or in a field and really think about where their food comes from and really think about sustainability and biodiversity and what that means and that richness in our lives and I think that's really important and I know there's a whole vibe around sea swimming at the moment and I'm here in my landlocked county in Westmeath and from Longford and the term grounded does not come from nowhere you know we talk about grounded as a really positive thing and I find that in the stillness of the earth and actually standing and having that very strong sense of who I am as a human being on this planet and not me as a special individual human being but who we are as humans on the planet and the sea swimming is great and I'm not going to take from all those sea swimmers but when I see sea for me that is a churning and a you know and it and a tumultuousness and and that is unsettling for a landlocked county like me and so what I love about the trees and the Midlands farm part is that we have storms and those trees bend, but they don't break. Well, some of them do eventually, but you know what I mean? It's, it's that idea that we move with the storm, but we write ourselves back again. And we don't have that same tumultuousness that you get with waves and tides and seas. And yet I talk about ebb and flow all the time when I talk about art. And there I am rambling. So I'm going to stop and let you ask me a question. Well, look, I, I think the word collage co covers it nicely. Um, and let's talk about the art, because I will come back to some of the techie stuff. But let, let's yeah. talk about the art for a moment. So how would you describe your art? Where does that passion come from? Because you've kind of got this technology stream over here. And then you've got that sort of grounding groundedness that you, you mentioned. But then you've got this real passion for art. So could you maybe just explore that a bit for us? Okay, so like I suppose a lot of kids, uh, I always, I've always drawn. People ask me, you know, how long have you been painting? And I'm going, well, I suppose seriously, I only told people about it about four years ago, five years ago, but I've always been doing it. But it was something I would pick up and put down. And I realized when I stepped away, it's because I had nothing. I, I paint because I've got something to say. And I think it took me until about five years ago to figure out what it is made it worth my while to paint. I had something to say. For a long time, you know, I could paint and I can draw, but I was doing, you know, things just for the aesthetic and, and without a purpose and that without using them to make sense for me. So I would describe my paintings as contemporary landscapes. But one thing I realized recently is um, I, oh, it's, it's going to be on TV shortly, so I can talk about it. I was a wild card on Sky Arts Landscape Artist of the Year this year. And um, it was a really interesting experience, but I learned something from it, which is I don't paint landscapes. I use landscapes to convey a message about something else. I use them as a metaphor to talk about something that I need to express. So they're a vehicle. The landscapes are a vehicle to talk about something else. So that's how I would describe my art. It's, 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 they are landscapes. I want people to be able to read them, but they're quite abstract, but but to be able to read them as a landscape, but to find your own sense in them, I think. And that sense making is really important in terms of my day job as well as in my art job. So um, I, I am interested recently in, again, this convergence. I talked about how I bring art into my work, but now I'm seeing as how I'm bringing my work into my art. So last summer, I went to Paris for a month with my laptop worked from there but I also studied for a week at La Grande Ecole des Beaux-Arts and I did a, a one-week intensive course and it was called Portrait of a Walk and I'm there and I'm going doing some drawings the first day and I'm going but this is nonsense this is not a portrait of a walk this is a portrait of a, a moment in the walk the perfect portrait of a walk is of course James Joyce's Ulysses it's the perfect portrait of a walk it is it is a portrait of a one man walking through a city in a day and then I realized I'd walked every single day I was in Paris. So I went to my phone and I said, crikey, I've walked half a million steps. That's the portrait of the walk. And all of the data was in my phone every day, all the steps and where I'd been because I had corresponding photographs. And I remember thinking to myself how reductive 
a walk had become when we're only measuring steps and how reductive a walk is when we're only looking at destination. Because I'd seen all these people in Paris in this amazingly historic city taking photographs of themselves, selfies and TikToks and Instas reels in front of these amazingly historic symbolic monuments and buildings and art and I thought well, how reductive again it's about destination and data points and 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 I started doing these postcards of my walking around Paris just almost like Strava line drawings and I thought imagine if someone asked for a portrait of a walk in Paris and that's what you got and how reductive it was and it made me think about how we are so we're in this age of dataism where data is our thing you know like modernism or cubism and now we're in dataism and what post dataism going to look like and I think it's about tapping back into our humanity and then that brings my art back into my day job which is a work that is in tech and we talk about artificial intelligence and data and virtual reality and and what's what's right or what's real anymore Lily Allen God, she's amazing. So anyway, I digress. But yeah, it's uh, I can't talk now about art anymore without talking about post dataism and my work. And I can't talk about my work anymore without talking about the arts, if that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. And I love that um, thread in terms of the post dataism. Um, and I think that you've mentioned it a couple of times now uh joan where you talked about that sort of blending but it's almost as though you know you're having to bring one into the other now as opposed to the other way around so and i love the i love the paris story i mean that's that, that's so true and i i often call it and the term i i use sometimes because I'm, I'm a big fan of art but um i use the term retina loading for me it means to get away from the screens and to go and actually view some art, whether that's in real life or whether that's in a gallery. Um, and But also to, to not just experience it through my eyes, but to, to feel it and to, to, to try and make some sort of sense of it. Um, and that's very different to holding up a smartphone and taking a picture or a selfie or a TikTok or whatever uh, that you mention. And um, th there's something um, very counting the numbers and data points versus the human requirement and i think you've 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 sort of uh, illustrated that very very nicely that's a definitely a thinking point i think it's interesting uh, the, the concept of memory became very important to me in the last um couple of years my dad recently passed away and um he had dementia and i think about how we hold memories you know, in every part of us, in every, all of ourselves, and how we, some people remember it through smell, through sound, through, through visual. And I think we're going through this world and we're trying to experience so much, but we're taking all these photographs and we're outsourcing our lives because that's the sum of our lives is those connections that we make and those experiences that we have. And we're outsourcing a lot of that to our phone. I don't need to remember this because I've got a photo of it that I never go back and look at or now I can't find or rather than be in the moment and hardwire it into some part of you that you can really feel. And they're the things that you take with you. They're the bits that you really remember. Yeah, and I think as you look back on life, I think you touched on it there a moment ago, Joan, when it can be a, a smell or a taste or even sometimes music, you know, a certain song can immediately transport you back to somewhere. Uh, our smell is it... apparently our longest sense of memory is our smell. Okay. And so again, I say going through the city and experiencing through a series of photographs and outsourcing that to a device where it's not capturing all of those other senses. And I, you know, I'm a visual artist. So for me, I mean, it is the visual that I probably remember the most, but you need to be in it. Uh, there's a great line in Goodwill Hunting. When Robin Williams says to me, I bet you can give me the lowdown on, you know, every work by Michelangelo, but you cannot tell me what it feels like to stand in the Sistine Chapel, or you cannot tell me what it smells like, you know, and, and you know, it's easy to get the skinny and again, download the data on places or buildings or travel but it's different to actually being there and I think that kind of and, and that goes back to go stand in a field just connecting very much to who we are and that 
you know, I look at the scope of what Siemens with, you know, 360, 380,000 employees and the kind of really big stuff that we get to do infrastructurally as well as, you know, manufacturing and all of that. But we're in a very, you know, we're, we live in a, we're a very interesting technology company in that we deal very much with the physical world and we're in that, that real liminal space between the two, between the, the virtual and the, and the real world. And I think that's probably what makes it such a good fit for me, probably, probably but uh, yeah. I like so, that. so tell me then, you touched back on, on Siemens and obviously Siemens, it's a global, huge global organization. Yeah. Um, but your role, you're, you're looking at this sort of digitalization and the sustainability. So what are the key areas of, of what you're doing there? Well, I have a lot of uh, colleagues who are much smarter and wiser than I am, and they make solutions uh, and, and they can solve. My answer is they can solve pretty much any problem because they're really, really smart engineers. But Picasso said it. I love that man. He said, computers are useless. They only ever tell you the answer. Now. Siemens are brilliant because they will be able to tell you the answer, but they're also about asking the question. My role is about asking those questions. That's what how I get to exist there is I go to companies. I've got a meeting next week. I'm really excited. And, and it's because I'm going to go and get to ask, what is your market going to look like 10 years from now? And of course, the end, you know, some of the the people we work in this data-driven world and they go no one knows i don't know what it's going to look like 10 years from now i said well yeah so you may as well imagine it like let's just imagine what the market not your business the market will look like 10 years from now the next question is what's your role going to be in that and what do you need to start doing now to help you get there i go through those three questions that's my role within within siemens and my small part that I get to play on the mo the really way more clever people than me who then when you've decided what you need to do to get there they help you do all of that and we have all the bits for all of that and the technology to build it all together but I get to be the part that is what are the questions and helping people work out the answers to those questions so I had a very very wise man who drove me in a taxi one day in Dublin and uh, he asked me what I did and I described it and he said so you're a digitalization coach then and I'm going actually yes you know what you're right and I had never called myself that before but he was right a coach a really good executive coach or life coach they don't tell you the answers they ask you the questions to help draw out the, your answers for you and because you only only you know you and I would never presume to know any of my clients business is better than they do so what i get are their customers better than they do so what i get to do is probe them on those questions and help them draw out what they in a lot of times intuitively tacitly know but forcing them into those questions and really pushing them on that because we all say no one knows the future but deep down when we go drilling into it and this is where creativity is really important because uh, the one thing for sure that's going to happen is there will be disruption. There has always been disruption. The disruption is nonlinear. And artists are nonlinear, even the ones who paint in straight lines. They're, we're not linear thinkers. So you need to, that's why we, I want to work with, with business leaders to, to start tapping back into their innate creativity that they were all born with. Because every single one of those women and men who are leading organizations now, when presented with a cardboard box when they were three, saw a castle and a fire engine and a house and a train, and they didn't see it as a receptacle of storage to move something from A to B. They didn't see a box like we see a box now. And we get that functional fixedness, hardwired ourselves into that practicality. We need to get back to the artist mindset of this is what I have, this is what it can be to get to that kind of level of disruption. Well, I, I love the getting back to the artist mindset. Uh, that's so true. But but you also mentioned another word there in terms of disruption. Um, and because, look, I'm going to harp back here to be when you were the, 
chief executive of the Irish Internet Association through some very interesting years of growth. And also you mentioned at the top that you were the centre director for the cloud computing and commerce, you know, that sort of um, uh, the Irish centre that you were you were running there yeah. for a while. So when it comes to art and disruption, we're hearing an awful lot, aren't we? We're right in the throes of AI art and the oh, data yeah. sets. And I've got to ask you as an artist and a technologist, What's your view on where we're at and where you think this is going? Okay, so um, two thoughts on that. First of all, somebody asked me once would I put my art on an NFT? And I said at the time, and I probably still now, no, they're not environmentally uh, sustainable NFTs generally, so no. Um, and I said, but someone said, but it's progress. And I said, well, it, it's only progress if it's at, as a minimum sustainable. Um, the other thing for me is, and I, and I gave a presentation on this and I use a Jackson Pollock painting as an example. On, on any contemporary art, a lot of people, you know, people who don't know art, they might go in, see modern art and they go, God, a child could do that. Reality is a child can do that. So when a child does a spatter painting and Jackson Pollock does a spatter painting, why is one of them real, you know, profound art and the other one not? And the answer is intention. And that's where I came back, coming back to what makes us intensely human, it's intention, intention and purpose. So uh, I think when you talk about AI generated art and uh, Nick Cave actually talked, he did an article there a couple of weeks ago and he talked about the idea of ChatGPT doing, doing a, a song in the, in, the, in the style of Nick Cave. And he said, data doesn't suffer, data has never suffered. The underlying intention and purpose, that's surely what makes it art. Somebody asked me one day, I put up a photograph on Instagram pre-painting and it was, it was just like my sheets that I put down on that, that table behind me and I, they're covered in paint. And someone said, oh my God, frame that, it's amazing looking. And I'm going, oh, that's so offensive. You know, because it was an accident. And I'm not saying there are not happy accidents in paintings, but there's a certain amount of happy accident, but there is, there is intention in the work. And so there's emotion, there's, there's purpose, there's a reason we're doing it. And without that, it, it's not really art in my mind. So if a computer is generating it, you will get um, something to put on your wall for sure in the aesthetic sense. Would I call it art? Probably not in that true sense, depending on what you define as art. And then, yeah, I, I think that intention piece is really, really important um, because otherwise we may as well just, you know, I, I think when your child does it and it is their spatter painting, that is definitely art for you because there is that love and intention and that child did it for you. So I'm not taking from that at all, but it's um, it's just, uh, I have this other sense too. And somebody, I was actually talking about this uh, just the other day about um, dragon theory and uh, how museums have vast collections of art that no one ever sees, and it's kind of dragon's theory, and you've got people buying and collecting art, and I find this with NFTs, you're buying it and you're hoarding it, but no one else can actually see it, so what do you actually own? And I have this thing that it's not art until someone has seen it. So when I do a painting, it exists as matter, but it is not a painting, it's not a piece of art until people have seen it. For me, that's part of the process. It, it, it exists as matter, but it is not art until people have seen it. And maybe that's probably where my hang up is on kind of, well, NFT digital art proving that you own it, but if no one sees it or can experience it, then is it really art or is it just matter? Yeah, thank you, John. This, you've raised some very interesting points there. and. Um... At the moment, I know a lot of the data sets run up data sets run up to about twenty twenty one that's changing rapidly even as we're speaking and recording that this. Mm -hmm. But if I said to AI, make me a painting in the style of Joan Mulverhill because your stuff's out there and some some data set somewhere has scraped that data, um, yeah, it opens up that whole copyright who's the artist? Are you allowed to do that and we still haven't bottomed any of that discussion out yet because the technology is racing ahead. Well, maybe then we get to the point about beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And yep, someone is, they'll, they'll, if anyone could be bothered to copy one of my paintings, as my sister said, well, you know, probably no one's going to steal it yet, Joan, you know, but um, they could. 
and I can't really stop them from doing that. And yeah. I just go, and you can do that and hang that on your wall, or you can buy a print, or you can, but or you know, and and that's fine. But there is something it's, it's, about the process and the word that you were using there. But there's was something in, about the process. Yeah, and the word that you perfect. the word that you've brought up a few times, John, is intent. Intent. It's the exactly. intent, right? And, uh, and, and it's so that human. You can buy that piece of aesthetic to put on your wall like you would buy a roll of wallpaper and i just feel like well you know i do that knock yourself out each to their own for what they want to hang on their walls if you want art actual art then yeah maybe you should buy from an artist <laughs> as opposed to if you want aesthetic and wall filler and, and i'm not i'm not detracting from it like you know and and loads of people i mean i'm not against buying prints either because you can get beautiful prints but it's it's about understanding um putting a value on those things and, you know, the market is, you know, whatever someone is prepared to pay. But if you're interested in art in that sense, in the art itself, and, and what is it that makes us human? And some of those stories behind it, like somebody said to me, John, I, you know, I love your work, but I love it even more now that I understand why. Some people want to hear that why and some people don't. But for me, I can't paint unless I've got my why. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Joan. And listen, thanks for sharing all your, your thoughts on, on this landscape because it's it's forever changing and it's somewhere between the human condition and true passion uh, and, the, and the data sets. We'll, we'll see where we end up, but I, I don't well, think... I'm, I'm very lucky, actually, yeah. that I have a role that allows me to converge those worlds and that I work in an organisation that has got the humanity to allow me to be as both of those people at the same time yeah and you've done a little bit of work haven't you with the irish art society as well yeah i'm, I'm on the council for the contemporary irish art society which i call them fondly the original crowd funders which they weren't even really aware of but they were set up in the 60 years ago because there was no market for contemporary irish artists and a group of people came together and said you know we've got artists here who are struggling no one no one will buy their work the government can't afford to buy their work the state didn't have any money the galleries couldn't afford to buy new work so these people came together crowdfunded bought art and then gave it on loan lifetime loan to loads of institutions and we've got a big launch coming up where we're doing lending some art to the connected hubs so we're doing a pilot because they're beautiful public realm spaces and they need art on their walls and we want to encourage those centers then to use their spaces as community art spaces too and to invest in paintings from their own local art community artist community so it's a real it's a really lovely um virtuous circle and uh, i'm really happy to be really happy to be involved that's a real mix isn't it of the technology world and the art world coming together yeah that exactly like great, again it's, it's my converging and yeah. uh where I get to bring, I went to the Business to Arts Awards actually last year and I was 50-50 in the audience for who I knew. Half the world didn't know I painted and we're going, they knew me from business and the other half only know me as an artist and they didn't know I had a corporate job. So it's it's really, I, I really do get to live in that lovely sweet spot in the middle. Well, congratulations on that and on the upcoming Sky uh, Arts TV. Um... Oh, no, I was just a wild card. There's every chance I'm I'm on the cutting room floor, but it was a really fun experience to do. But yeah, but I mean, look, it's fantastic, John, and it's great to have that that balance in life, isn't it? And to, to yeah. be able to, to follow that, you know. And and I think from a work-life balance point of view, I have to say that they, there is a really symbiotic relationship and they each support and feed the other. I couldn't do my day job the way I do without painting and I couldn't paint the way I do if I didn't have a day job that allowed my mind to be so stimulated all the time in things that are really interesting to me so well that's wonderful and look before we run out of time I want to ask you a couple of other things so I'm going to change sure. direction slightly yeah I'm going to ask you about books next or things that you read now, whether you don't, you might say, look, I don't read at all. I just take things in in the real world or I search the Internet for anything I want. Or you might have a particular genre or author that you love, or you might be an audio book person. But when it comes to your learning style or onboarding information, whether for work or for pleasure, how does that work for you, Joe? OK, if you were to ask me if I was to reach to the left slightly over there, what books are on my coffee table? Honestly, there are two really, really old brown yellowed books from 1865. And they're the essays of John Ruskin, who is the um, 
He was one of the founders of the National Trust in the UK and his observations on nature literally make me cry. And I often pick up and just read random passages of those. And that makes me sound terribly proper and deeply intellectual, which I'm totally not, because I mean, I am terrible at reading that stuff, but I do, there was wisdom in his pages that it just, and, and his observation is so acutely beautiful. It blows my mind. Well, he was but a, he's true, got other a true polymath as well, right? I mean, yeah, a real yeah. polymath, a bit of a misogynist, but it was well, given pass of, of his time. But he wrote this, there's a bit, I could probably quote it off the top of my head, because I can't reach over there, but it is, um, so often it comes when you're reading a book and we think of the author, oh, that's exactly what I think. And we think it's great. Whereas really she would be saying, oh, I never thought of that before. And yet I see now that it is true. And if I do not now, perhaps I will someday. That we should always be looking to read not what confirms what we already believe, but something that we had a way of thinking that we hadn't thought of before. So if you ask me what I read most contemporary right now, uh, Paul D. O'Reilly, the academic down in UCC, that man's posts on LinkedIn fry my brain on a weekly basis. And he is my now not author, author of choice. So I'm getting a lot of my material from LinkedIn and some of the stuff that he's posting, which I'm finding fascinating. And, um, and again, converging on some ideas that I've been having around what I say, what, what gets measured gets missed. So missing out on that sensibility, nuanced piece and not just the data. And he was running a similar kind of vibe at the same time in a post he'd made. So anyway, he's my current uh, reading material of choice. I read obsessively when on holidays and then nothing for the rest of the year or I'm dipping in and out of, as I say, more like essays and poetry. I read a lot. Um, but, yeah, no, I haven't sat down and read a big old, long book in a while. Terrible I love, I love I love that from from LinkedIn posts to the 1800s. I love that. Uh, well, actually, yeah. Now that I hear it, the way you said it, yes, it's bizarre. I'm reading LinkedIn posts, and yeah, the 1800s. Yeah, brilliant. Paul O'Reilly, John Ruskin, same thing. Fantastic. I love that, and I love the um, what gets measured gets missed, uh, and you you lose that nuance. Like I think that's a wonderful uh, observation because it's not the the phrase that most people are familiar with. Yeah, we well, I mean, there is the data, as I said, the data is true of what happens today and what happened yesterday. There's no data points for the future. And unless we get into the full understanding and nuance of everything that's going on around the data and the contextualization for that, we will miss a lot of why certain things are happening. I love that. And Joan, we talked earlier um, about this collage of a journey that you that you're on. Mm -hmm. But when you look back at your life, uh, now this could go back to your childhood, it could be something that happened to you last week. There must be people that you admire, people that you look to, people that have inspired you along the way. Or maybe it's a character trait. But when I ask you that, how what, what springs to mind? Um, I was asked this question in an interview during lockdown, and I said, my dad... Uh, the fact that he's recently passed away, I think we should not talk about that now or I'll possibly cry for you. But um, yeah, like I, I think my I think my upbringing, my parents, both of them, um, my mum wouldn't read fiction for love nor money. I'm her only non-STEM child. So I think and I think, you know, for all of that, like my dad, the farmer, I think he had a really romantic soul. Uh, but my mom is amazing. So, yeah, my parents, I had an incredible teacher. Everyone talks about the incredible teacher. I remember the night after I won a big award and I was at home, I was walking along the canal with my mom and my aunt and there was a bench and I went over to it. I said, mom, is that bench new? And she said, look at it. And it says, commemorate me where there is water. And it was from Canal Bank Walk. And the bench was dedicated to Peter Kern, who was my English teacher. And I started to cry. And my mom, my aunt Nora said, what's wrong? And mom said, he said, oh, he was the start of it all. And Nora said, explain. And I said, well, I was the captain of the debate team. And he said, Joan, you can say whatever you want. You back, just long, as long as you can back it up. And he taught me and allowed me to trust my own instincts for and explore and really push myself of what do I believe? What do I think is true? And beyond what is obvious or to, he, he let me go there as long as I could back it up. And, and that kind of empowering teacher who encouraged me to read all around the curriculum not just what was on that straight line and that explorative 
mindset. He he was a phenomenal teacher and he was definitely definitely a very um important person in my journey um and and then through then like i'm just really lucky i've been blessed by great organizations great managers great colleagues you know i i'm always inspired by guts i look at people like elva lee that i worked with in uh in the Irish Internet Association. And there's just, you know, resilience, fortitude, guts, creativity, people who can just really smile and grit their teeth and we'll get on with it. And and I just find that inspiring. And I, I had to, we I go to congregation every year that Owen Kennedy runs. That inspires me every year. And there's 80 people there. And anything from community workers to really, you know, big business leaders. And we're all there talking about um a one word topic and this year's topic was purpose and i had to write something and i wrote about the purpose the sense of purpose of the ordinary person you know we think about you know what purpose and the people that we looked up to you know we feel like it should be some higher purpose some bigger thing and there is i think there is such romantic dedication and honor in doing the very ordinary jobs and I don't mean that in any kind of patronizing way but it takes real guts to do those and we don't need to be doing amazing things we just need to be kind to the people around us and I think they're the people I admire thank you thank you for sharing those stories with us Joan because it's lovely to hear about your your father and your your parents you know your mother too and uh your teacher and your your work colleagues and uh you said something that stuck with me earlier about your father with his dementia unfortunately prior to his passing which i'm very sorry to hear um but it does make you realize about the memories that you have in life and when that you know uh when some people lose that it, it really it really gets into the the human side of who we are and I, there's some heartbreaking stories at the moment some people i'm pretty close to or my family is pretty close to and when you lose that emotional connection to somebody because they can't recognize you, it's a very challenging time. And um, it, it just that what you were saying earlier about that emotional connection and the human side and the intent and the taking time to make a memory is so important because as you're walking down and you see the bench and it takes you straight back to that great advice you were given, you know, you can say anything you like as long as you can back it up, Joan. Well, and that's, that's, that stays with you to this day. It's really, I had a strange moment with my dad and I'm going to share this story with you and you may edit it out if you need to, but I did a painting after he was diagnosed with cancer and uh, we talked about it. Now he already had some dementia at this stage and he kept pushing me on it. It was called We'll Meet Here and it was about he and I meeting when this was all over. And uh, months later, I went, I was with him in the hospital one day and he had no idea who I was. But I had a photograph of that painting on my phone. It was in an exhibition in Dublin and I was just showing it to him, you know, making conversation. He did not know who I was, but he saw that painting on my phone. And he said, Joan did that. That's wonderful. He didn't know I was Joan, but he knew that was my painting. And I think it's interesting how we form memory and what memory really is and what part of us is connecting. It may not be the bit that we think it is. And I think it's interesting that we joke that my dad always said, Joan's coming to visit and he'd go, oh, Joan, she's the artist, isn't she? And I thought that was really interesting because again, I don't even painting professionally relatively recently, but I think it's because he always knew I was one long before I started doing it. And I think that was the part of him that connected us. And I think that's interesting. Well, he probably had the earlier uh, Pollock works that you'd worked on, the splatter paint. <laughs> sure my mum is, <laughs> bless her heart, my mum is much better at minding all that stuff than my dad was. And she has, my house is like, my parents' house is like the greatest fridge door. You know the way the kids bring home their artwork and they put it on the fridge door? My sisters have joked that my parents' house is just one big fridge drawer to Joan's stuff. There's paintings of mine all over the house. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think 
they've been minding them for a long time and I'm going to give my mom full for credit for that. But I did think it was interesting, as I say, how we experience life and which part of our senses are we on what level we're connecting with people. And I don't know that my dad connected with my day job as much as for all of those years, he knew who I really was before I did. Well, thank you for sharing that, Joan. I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, the other thing I want to ask you is about, we talked about, uh, you know, being uh, inspired or people that have motivated you. And we sort of, we sort of fell into advice there a little bit. But is there any other advice that you've received throughout your career or your journey so far? Or do you find yourself often sharing advice with people that you think we should share with our audience today? I would never presume to be able to advise anyone other than to say there are no wrong decisions. And my dad always said no regrets. And I, and I think it was based on this idea that we make the best decision we can with the information that's available to us at this time. And, and I think never regret anything because there's not a shred of evidence on this planet for any of us that any other course of action could have brought us to a better or worse moment than this one. So I'm a big believer in we are where we are and we move forward from here. There's that great, uh, I keep quoting, but uh, Dante, the divine comedy, there comes a point in the dark wood of our life where the straight path is wholly lost. And then there's that other story about what do you do when you're lost in the forest? And the answer is stand still. The trees ahead of you and the bushes beside you are not lost. So know where you are when we say we are where we are. Know where that is and we move forward from there. And people ask me, you know, oh, I don't know whether I should go for this job or not. And I'm going, well, you don't have to make a decision about the job until you've been offered it. So keep moving forward. It's that principle of design thinking. Just know the next best step. Know where you are. Don't overly, if you're unsure of yourself, you don't need to know exactly what it's all going to look like. You know, I ask people, what's the market going to look like 10 years from now? You don't have to be right. You don't have to know, no. You just have to have a sense of where you're going and know the next best step. But have a really good sense of where you are right now and keep all your options open while moving forward. So you have to take some steps, but just know the next best one. Love that. That's great advice. Thank you, Joan. Um, and before we definitely run out of time, I just want to squeeze in a couple of quick ones. So sure. when you look at when you look at the next six to 12 months, what's taking up your mental capacity? What are you thinking about? What are you hoping to achieve? What's on the roadmap for Joan? Um, the roadmap for Joan this, the next six months is really, if I was talking about my Siemens role, very particularly what I'm focused on right now is this concept of how we, um, how we lead for digitalization, how we help business leaders and support them in those questions about the market 10 years from now. We are in a period of rapid change. I want to get that message to as many of those business leaders as possible to start thinking about the market 10 years from now. The technology is all going to be there. We can lean into and trust that. There are loads of smart people who can solve the problems, but the, que the, the biggest challenge for leaders right now is those questions and addressing those. And in a time of phenomenal change that we've seen over the last couple of years, whether it's pandemics or war, the trajectory is still forward. We cannot take our eyes off the ball of sustainability. That will be there pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, pre-war, post-war. What are we fighting for? It's for the planet that we're all living on. And so we need to keep our eye firmly on that. And I want to keep to get that back on the radar more for the next six months and here and forever. Very good. Thank you, Joan. My well, artist, look. my artist goal is just to get back painting. I took a bit of hiatus for the last three months. I think I was nearly afraid to think of what I was thinking about to paint. So now I have to get back on track or he'll haunt me yeah. forever. Yeah, well, you have you have you have a great exhibition coming up as well, don't you? With the I have one in the Lewin Gallery at the moment, yeah. so that closes um in ten days, and uh, there's one in Walters and Delary, and then but now I have to get back on track now and get it get some new work. Very good. 
Well, look, before we finally wrap up, is there anything else we haven't touched on or anything else you want to share with our audience? And also, if people want to get in touch or find out more about your art or the things that you're involved in, where's the best place to send people to, Joe? Um, the place I exist as both versions of my careers is on LinkedIn, for sure. John Mulvihill, Digitalization and Sustainability Lead at LinkedIn. I, I post paintings there sometimes as a vehicle, again, to talk about what's interesting to me at work. Um, but to follow just art, you can go to my website, johnmobile.com or at m 6 on Instagram. But LinkedIn is my, my preferred space to catch me because I don't believe that I exist in isolation day job to, and I hate calling it day job because I think about it all the time. <laughs> so my, my career job and my arty job, um, they coexist on LinkedIn. So that's probably the best place always to get me. Well, look, that's a great place for us to uh, end today's discussion. Thank you very much indeed to Joan uh, Mulverhill for joining me today on the Global Discussion. Thank you, Joan. Thanks to everybody for watching and listening uh, to the Global Discussion. I'd, I'd like you to like, follow, subscribe, do all the normal things you do to support a podcast. And hopefully you'll join me back here for some more discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. Joan, it's been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you. Thanks for being on the Global Discussion. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed the chat. Thanks, Joe.